something very strange happened to me in late June of this year. I was genuinely struggling for what I call my big video essay ideas that I present to the patrons, which they then vote on to decide what I bring to you all. Normally I have about five or six ideas that I'm vaguely interested in, and usually one of them just wins outright in a landslide. And sometimes, you know, we've had occasions where it's close, or even, like, exactly tied, which was a real experience for me to try and figure out, because it did not solve the problem that this is intended to solve, which is that I don't like making decisions, and also it's just kind of a nice way for patrons to have a little bit of a say over the direction of the channel since they're kind of my boss, right? So, and, and it just, and it does kind of save me from the content creator trap of veering off into chasing trends and I get to focus on stuff that I at least have like a kernel of interest in. So, you know, if you want to tell me what to do on this channel, I guess now's as good a time as any to do all the panhandling. Uh, yeah, you know, there's a Patreon. I know Patreon's had a bit of a weird 24 or so hours before the recording, but, you know, it, it's there. It's the easiest way to, to support the channel other than subscribing and liking, which you should also do. So what's a content creator struggling for ideas to do? Well, I decided to open the floor to video ideas in the VIP bit of my Discord for Twitch subscribers and patrons and select friends of the show. I then saw this suggestion from Inside Left, and before I show it to you, I just want to say that Inside Left has been a long-time friend of the show and patron. This video isn't, you know, that always sunny bit where we're like, who are we doing it versus? We're not doing it versus them. In fact, they also make YouTube videos and you should check out their channel and subscribe. This is not a beef video. That being said, if he does a response video, I'm going to immediately do a response video of my own. But let's just look at what his suggestion was to me. I saw it and decided to throw it into a poll, which the patrons and Twitch subscribers get to vote on. And a subtle hint here, if you want me to do your 2013 ass idea, this is how you get me to do it. And it turns out those people picked this topic. Narrowly, admittedly, but I genuinely thought it wouldn't be of interest. But here we are doing the topic for this video and I was left with a series of questions which again are not me making this video versus inside left I want people to not have that idea at all but I was curious about where he got this idea from because you might say as I've done in recent videos that I have the luxury of simply asking him and some might say that he explained himself on the patreon page a little bit but I'm ignoring that at least mostly. And I want to understand where this topic has emerged from, what are the conditions to it that lead to it not just being suggested but voted for by the patrons for a video to be made about it. And in this video I want to go into some of the, the questions that I had. What do we mean by gamer exactly? What do we mean when we talk about their culture? Why it matters? Or whether it even matters? And whether it is in fact the left's problem to solve. If there's even really a problem in the first place, I'm sure if you've clicked on this video, you've come in with an opinion on whether or not that's the case or whether the left has anything to offer or not. And regardless of whether you agree or disagree by the end of this video, I hope that it, like it's at least entertaining for you. And if you are like a streamer or like a hardcore person who's really deep into gaming culture and have come here to sort of pause and mock and laugh at the video just give it a chance just give it a chance i promise you you might be a little surprised by some of the things i say with all that out of the way let's just get right into it the first thing i want to do in this video is establish exactly who i mean when i say gamer because like in that video about politicians I did last month, it's a term that means a lot of things that ranges from anyone who plays video games regularly, which is a cohort of people that basically can mean anyone in the world who owns a smartphone, which is a group so broad that according to some estimates that would be like 86% of the human population, or it could be as narrow as like people who play, you know, video games for 12 hours a day and, you know, like, relentlessly grind on MMORPGs. So those definitions feel totally unhelpful. 
And I don't want to be like that fascist politician in that last Black Mirror episode and be all, you know who I mean, in a sinister tone. But when you clicked on this video, when I said the word gamer, you absolutely knew who I meant and had an image of a type of guy. And I say the word guy deliberately because the subsection of the general population takes on a particular shape in our imaginations and in the way I intend to approach everything in this video. Interestingly, I've often found the label of gamer applied to people outside of gaming contexts. I was called some gamer dude who sometimes talks about politics by a notoriously unpleasant transphobe on the website formerly known as Twitter in the context of me interviewing a high profile lawyer on my Twitch. And you might say, well, you kind of had that coming. And yeah, you're not like entirely wrong about that, to be honest. But none of what I was doing was gaming in that situation. Twitch is associated with gaming for obvious reasons, so maybe you're like, it didn't kind of make sense, but I wasn't, actually none of it was gaming, right? The person that sprang to mind to me of this gamer archetype that emerges in non-gaming context was the guy, well, there's probably lots of them to be honest, so just assume I mean the one I use in the screenshot that'll be on your screen now, who looks exactly like what we'd be imagining a capital G gamer to look like, getting really angry at the Barbie movie. Now, I don't know if this guy's channel does anything gaming related, but my point here is to say that he just nails the stereotypical look. Just to put my cards on the table, I don't have any serious intention of going out to do the Barbenheimer stuff. Not because I have any particular objection to those films. I mean, Oppenheimer is kind of a cowardly loser in my estimation, if you want the physicist opinion anyway. Uh, I don't think you should be making videos that are over an hour long about a movie where you don't like it and where your face looks like you're attempting to shit out a pool ball. It's just me, right? That's just my preference for the mode of content creation I like doing. And I'm not picking on the guy in the screenshot, but when we imagine a gamer who is a thought leader, such that he is, in that culture, even though it's not strictly accurate to who gamers are in bulk, we do imagine this kind of white, angry person who's probably approaching their 30s and has a lot of opinions. And before anyone decides to get clever in the comments, yes, I know, you don't need to point it out to me. I will note as a point of completion, I, and I suppose as a watcher of leftist YouTuber reacts to weird reactionary cringe videos, that I have seen people who fit into this kind of culture that I'm going to describe that are clearly young men in their late teens and early 20s. It's not just the follically challenged late 20s bearded dudes who are leading the charge on the spillover from gaming into wider culture. The challenge for me in this video isn't just defining a type of guy because you will absolutely had a similar guy in mind before I even started to explain myself. It's trying to explain what exactly gaming culture is before I can explain what the spillover outside of its traditional areas are, which means we're gonna to have to do a tiny, teeny tiny bit of history, cover some well-known things, and unfortunately probably talk briefly about my least favorite thing to talk about ever, but we're gonna to have to live with it. So some history. Modern gaming culture's origins are probably rooted in the post-video game crash era and the gradual resurgence of video games as something to be consumed by more mainstream audiences. The NES being marketed primarily as a toy was a direct result of repulsion to the concept of video games the mainstream markets had in the wake of such excellent games as the E.T. game that was so bad every existing copy of it was buried in the desert. This marketing trick by Nintendo was brilliant, but it also led to an unfortunate association, which is that gamers are commonly regarded as childish. While a grown man screaming at a movie he doesn't like, or gamers coming up with an entire theory because they don't like the ending of the game, and then making hours long videos about it, and yeah, this is about the indoctrination theory after the Mass Effect 3 ending fiasco, it doesn't exactly help with the image, right? I think it's wrong to write off gaming culture as childish. It might seem entitled, yes, 
but I've worked in a customer-facing job. It's not just gamers who are being giant babies, if they're not catered to precisely how they want. I'm just getting out ahead of that idea now. I'm not defining the culture along that particular stereotype. I don't want to do that. That's not interesting to me. That being said, there are some aspects you might stereotypically associate with gamers that are mostly rooted in fact. Take basically any game, especially one with multiplayer online capability, and type it into the YouTube search bar and add the word toxic and just hit search. And you'll almost certainly find a 10 to 30 minute long video decrying the game's community as toxic. Hell, you can just search gamers toxic and you'll probably find a video essay like this one mixed with very specific well-known games and people talking about those communities. Anyone who's been on a gaming forum knows that gamers, especially the ones we're describing for this video, are toxic. I'm going to be more specific about the kinds of toxicity I want to focus on a little bit, but I doubt I'll get very much pushback if I say that this is essentially an established fact that we can all accept. If you haven't been on a gaming forum and are just kind of rubbernecking at a group of people whose foibles you find interesting or relevant, then you'll have this sense of toxicity from gamers and gaming culture from basically every time it's smashed into the mainstream. The most noteworthy incident of this was Gamergate, whose shadow all of this discussion necessarily lives in, and you can just tell I love talking about. I can't get enough of it. I don't particularly want to get into the specifics of Gamergate, partially because I find that any actual discussion of it has a very low reward to effort ratio, just deeply unproductive generally as a topic, and because there are a lot of other people who have discussed it, explored it, and tried making some kind of productive content out of it, and have done it without being as just sort of deeply annoyed by it conceptually as me. That being said, I do think it's worth noting and mentioning here, one, because as I'll explain later, it displayed a lot of the specific issues with gaming culture and gamers that I want to focus on, and because some people draw a connection between Gamergate and the political atmosphere of the mid-2010s onwards. I don't want to give away too much right now, but while people are right that for a lot of people, this was the first major gamer event that collided into the mainstream in such a way that it spilled over into other areas, I am a tiny bit unconvinced by some of the things that I've seen on the topic, specifically people drawing a direct line between Gamergate, the people who joined in the harassment campaign, and the more extreme elements that propelled Donald Trump to president. At least, I don't think that line is necessarily as direct as people like to portray it to be. It wouldn't be right for me to talk about the kinds of cultures that develop in gaming spaces without poking a bit at the one that I belong to. Here's a question for you. Do you know what the The Crusader bit in my handle is meant to be about? It's not, as some co-workers of my partner believed, meant to indicate that I'm some kind of far-right extremist or that I glorify either the stupidity or brutality of the Crusades. That makes it a rather odd handle for someone with my politics to have, right? Well, it's because I played way too much Crusader Kings 2 and even started off my streaming career all the way back in April 2020 playing that game. One of the things about games made by Paradox, who are the people who blessed us with Crusader Kings, is that the community around the game is, well, let's just, let's just say it has its issues, right? This is the kind of thing that will happen with games that primarily deal with history, because as much as there are great historians and plenty of normal people interested in history, there are a lot of people who are statue avatar people who think that the whole of Rome was made of marble because of a quote from Augustus and think that no people of colour existed in Europe until around 1951. Also, you do see a lot of far-right sentiment. It's a lot like my love affair with Warhammer 40k. The people who enjoy it are either Marxists or fascists, and when you look at some of the server names on multiplayer Hearts of Iron 4, you do see some choice names. I mean, I do think there's something to the idea that people are a bit hypersensitive to certain things and assuming that the person is signalling that they're a fascist 100% of the time, 
but when you see that sort of thing in the context of a game about World War II, it gets a little difficult to assume anything else is going on. These issues have led to a recurring but rare experience on stream, and I'm being upfront about it being rare because streamers do have this habit of overstating their impact and importance, and I just don't like that. I don't like it at all. I would have people come into the stream for the first time and say something like, wow, a Crusader King slash Hearts of Iron streamer would good politics, exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark, that kind of thing, right? Which on the one hand is nice to hear, but on the other says a lot about the community produced by the games that I love and spend a lot of time playing. Now, to be fair to the people at Paradox, they do seem to be pushing back on these elements who enjoy their games. The best example of this is probably in the work that they've done with Crusader Kings 3, which is probably the easiest game in which for them to make this push, and really, that's possibly a topic for another video. But the things that game lets you do is not only accurate to the era as it would have existed, but the possibilities it allows are brilliant for the purposes of annoying statue avatar Twitter. Back to the actual topic, my point in that series of broad thoughts was to show you just how big gaming culture is, right? And therefore how diverse even the type of gamer we're trying to focus on is. So an attempt to construct a generalized culture for a group of people that are as broad as the kind of guy who gets mad at the Barbie movie, or who streams strategy games on Twitch, or who goes onto the Steam forums and asks whether a game is good or whether it's woke, doesn't make a lot of sense because we're just going to get bogged down. Even those specific types of person have various specific animating factors that make them potentially the type of gamer we want to talk about here. What I want to do instead of getting even more bogged down in trying to explain every single, you know, type of gamer toxicity is actually talk about the specific issues that are relevant to what I think Inside Left wanted me to address all the way back when he sent in the topic. Because while it's fun to poke fun at the guys who are getting mad at gay relationships in games, or people who invent entire theories to fix their favorite game's ending, it's not them I care about, it's the people who suffer and get caught up in the outbursts. Let's start talking about specific behaviors. Toxicity is more than a great song, by System of a Down, and it's an unfortunate byproduct of factors that, as we'll see later, are built into the form of some video games and the way communities have sort of constructed themselves, how the industry has to exist under capitalism, as well as well-documented anxieties that come with your particular hobby or special interest exploding in popularity. For people around my age, it might be a little difficult to think of a time when video games weren't the thing that everyone did at least for a little bit of their spare time, but a lot of the progenitors of this kind of toxicity did it on one of my favourite historical artefacts of online, old school forums and early multiplayer games where you would play your game through the dial-up modem. It still blows my mind that people were able to do that. Anyway, these did not have massive player bases of a game like, for example, Fortnite, which at the time I was writing this part of the script had over 3 million players online at that moment. According to an article in Dixato, the game has 350 million players in a month. As a point of comparison, according to a book on the legendary video game company id Software, and particularly John Carmack and John Romero, called Masters of Doom, How Two Guys Created an Empire and Transformed Pop Culture, which I am just so delighted that a book like that exists, one of the games that helped popularize a lot of the form for online games, particularly shooting games, was Quake, and sold 250,000 units initially. And that was a really well-performing game in the market. Like, it wasn't as good as some of their previous entries, but it was still pretty damn good. And I want you to remember these numbers when we think about resentment due to communities expanding, and they'll also be relevant as we're walking through everything. 
because one is that that resentment I've mentioned is a powerful motivator, especially when people you don't see as real or true gamers begin to get into it, and that a player base of millions now is going to contain a lot of different types of people. It was much more plausible for 250,000 Quake players to mostly be the same type of guy than it is for 350 million Fortnite players to be the same type of guy. So just to be clear, I don't play Fortnite, and I don't think anyone's going to find that especially surprising, but my guess is that my idea that 350 million people who play that game are not all going to be 350 million cis het white men is probably essentially correct. So even if we didn't have a hypothesized overspill from gaming circles into the wider zeitgeist, this would still be pretty important. At least that's what I think the person we're doing this video versus thinks about this. For what it's worth, the person we're doing this video versus is correct. If you are a person of color or LGBTQ, a woman, and you happen to be an avid gamer who's not just aggressively playing strategy games on their own against the AI, I am 100% certain that you have an anecdote about the way other gamers have treated you in the past that I probably could not describe on YouTube.com without getting in some kind of TOS issue. That is to say there exists, as there inevitably would be in a group as large as gamers are today, bigoted attitudes. But SK, I hear you say, this is inevitable in a group that's remotely representative of the public at large, and you're right, but you have to consider degrees of impact and whether we think gaming and the culture around it is acting as an incubator for a further reactionary backlash, especially in the context of communities that in the anglophonic world and beyond are pretty directly threatened right now. To provide a specific example, let's return to Gamergate. I know but we have to take our medicine before we can get better, and I'm not going to enjoy this any more than you're going to enjoy it. Gamergate was a harassment campaign that primarily targeted women. The particular one that everyone remembers, I think, is Anita Sarkeesian, who the mere mention of will send a certain type of guy, and it is, invariably, a guy into a frenzy. It won't be a shock to any of the women watching this video that women tend to suffer more harassment online than men. And in this case, it took a very dark turn with the nature of the harassment being so severe that the fear of upsetting the YouTube algorithm god, I cannot be that specific about it. But if you're on this video, you almost certainly know the form it took, and you can almost certainly search for it in, on google.com if you don't know. You might be wondering what it is that gamer gators were so upset about that they had to indulge in a misogynist campaign of harassment. Well, if you ask them, it's about identity. Sure, some of them say it's about ethics in game journalism, but it's identity, trust me. Both protecting their identity as gamers, but also an opposition to feminism's perceived influence in games, which in 2014, I'm a tiny bit at a loss as to what that specifically meant and what they called social justice warriors, which now generally has been supplanted by the term woke as the catch-all term for things that hurt the feelings of white guys. While I'm reluctant to take people caught up in a reactionary harassment campaign at their word because reactionaries are lying liars who lie and because ultimately they do not express a coherent belief system at the best of times, this is pretty in line with the current atmosphere around gaming culture in places. On top of misogyny, one of the behaviours we're likely to encounter is racism. This is one of those things where there's actually too many incidents to pick a specific one, but just the existence of the term heated gamer moment, which was a term coined by notorious far-right Anglo-Fish impersonator Ian Mao Shong to defend PewDiePie after he said the N-word on stream, Look, I'll, I'll throw a link to the Know Your Meme page down below if you're that curious about the term, but all you really need to know for this video is the stuff on the screen and what I just said. I'll just say that earlier I did do a whole bit about Paradox Games and their reputation, so I don't think we need to do a deeper dive into racism among gamers. My only further observation 
would be that racism within gaming culture is not solely the preserve of strategy game enthusiasts. Then we come to an incident that I will actually be referring to later on in the video involving queerphobia. Let me tell you all about something that happened to me on stream, and I promise it will it's relevant, okay? I'm just on stream, like usual, doing something I don't really quite remember what it was specifically. The chat's interacting with me in the usual way, and I see this message. It's in all caps, and it's the word Nick Merckx. And I don't know who or what that is. This isn't me having a boomer moment, I just don't understand what I'm meant to take away from this combination of letters that's been spewed into my chat. Now, I don't advertise my personal orientation and gender stuff on Twitch or really do it very prominently at all anywhere because I just never thought it was something that needed to form a significant part of my online presence. And to be honest, I think sometimes we underestimate the power of just telling people it's not their business. I do, however, say I'm a leftist prominently. I used the tag on Twitch and I decided to look into what a Nick Merckx was. Lucky for me, a YouTuber I like, Noah Samson, made a video about the controversy and that's how I caught up on what happened at the time. There is a link in the description if you need to catch up too. There is no shame in that. The leftist tag on Twitch can attract trolls. And the thing is that trolling on Twitch is incredibly weak. I mean, a group of leftist posters in the UK made so many photoshops of a journalist's forehead that he wears hats indoors now. You think saying the name of a streamer I've never heard of is gonna rattle me? Anyway, the short summary of the incident is that Nick Merckx responded to a tweet condemning anti-LGBTQ protesters using physical violence outside of a school board meeting in Glendale about whether the school area district, I don't know how it works in America, I'm sorry everyone, uh, should recognize Pride Month with the tweet, they should leave little children alone, that's the real issue. Now, I shouldn't have to explain this, but in the context of historic and contemporary moral panics around queer people, in the contemporary case this is primarily focused on trans women specifically, but it is expanding in scope at an alarming rate, this is quite an inflammatory statement to make, especially with the platform he has. His tweet was viewed over 15 million times. This did lead to consequences, which we'll discuss more specifically later, but the consequence was that Activision removed a skin bundle from Call of Duty that was his or something. Look, I haven't played Call of Duty since Modern Warfare 2. I don't know what any of this stuff is exactly, but I am to take that this is a big deal, apparently. He then went on to try to insist that he isn't queerphobic by deploying a slightly less overtly anti-LGBTQ argument, which is that he wants to be the one to explain to his kids and that he didn't mean to upset anyone, all while standing by the original tweet. So we have the classic non-apology standing by the original tweet that in our current context, and to be honest in any context, is pretty inflammatory towards vulnerable communities, and this guy wants to be the one explaining this stuff to his kids, and he wonders why people favour general education on these issues in schools. I'm not going to get too deep into this because, as I said, Noah Samson did a good video about it, and I'm not going to change anyone's mind on this because if you think Nick Merckx is in the right on any of this, then to be honest, you're just not going to listen to anything I have to say. With those examples, I want to think about a hypothesis that I've seen and that I actually think has some merit. Gamer culture having smashed into the mainstream is now impacting general culture more widely and is therefore having political effects on its own terms rather than solely being impacted upon by wider culture. The things that I've described just then, the various incidents and events, are both results of and indications that fandoms have been radicalized. There's a really good video by Inuen the Studios called How to Radicalize a Normie that has a pretty big section on the infiltration of fandoms and I just highly recommend the whole thing to you but that section is kind of where a lot of these thoughts are coming from, so go check out that video. The point is that fandoms, specifically gaming fandoms for our purposes, have now become large enough that they're able to impact beyond the expected circles. Whether it's your hobbyist discord where you set up multiplayer matches or video games media, the potential impact is now beyond the circles you would expect, right? In a way, 
it always has been, but the proliferation of online accelerated by things like the pandemic and increasing alienation on the capitalism really pours fuel onto the fire. The big example of how gamer culture impacted the mainstream is, once again, Gamergate, with some proposing a direct line from Gamergate to the election of Donald Trump, which I've already kind of mentioned, while I don't necessarily believe that that line is di as direct as some like to believe, I can see why people would see the harassment campaign, the focal points of it, and how that might contribute to the election of a racist rodeo clown. I do, however, think there's a danger of thinking a bit too proximately about what impacts politics. Of course, if you're a gamer, or a games journalist, or a person whose primary media consumption is video games, you're going to see a lot of patterns that are familiar to you in the alt-right that fueled Trump's online fandom and elements of fandoms that you may have found yourself alienated from. There is a danger that we're mistaking proximity to us for significance. And I want to caution all of us, including me, against doing that, especially when I think about Inside Left's initial suggestion that led to this topic and video being a thing. That's right, Inside Left, but I've not forgotten you or what this video is really about. A good, more contemporary lens through which we can see the impact of gaming culture or games on wider political discourse is something we've discussed earlier. It's the gamer dude gives his opinions on Barbie while he's visibly molding, or something that I do which is streaming on Twitch and talking politics. Twitch is, whatever your preferred content on there, a gaming and gamer platform first and foremost. The popularity of politics content implies a certain degree of politicization of gamers, where once the issue was to keep games and gaming spaces apolitical, it's not a coincidence that my politics-based streams are the most popular ones that I do, mainly because my gaming interests are a tiny bit niche, and that one of the recurring jokes about gamers is that they see binaries where the options are things that we'd describe as our stereotypical gamer and their view of the world, and the other option is political. The mood I'm trying to describe among gamers here is one that's deeply anti-political. It's just that they don't care that they are some of the most political people out there, which is generally true of people who embrace anti-politics anyway. The ideologies that have dominated taking advantage of resentments and the sense of community that people get from gaming are seen less as politics and more like a costume you have to wear to enter a Halloween party. Only, it's a costume that a lot of people can't or won't take off once they leave the party. It becomes their whole thing, and suddenly we've gone from guy who's really into map games to guy who constantly plays the mod of map game where the Nazis won World War II and tries to get Himmler in charge of Germany, but insists it's all memes. Which is uncomfortable for people around them. Memes about what the succession to Hitler in the alternative universe where he won World War II looks like, they're not just slightly off-colour jokes, but pretty unsettling when you know how the far-right colonised these communities. And I use the word colonise advisedly. If you're not a cishet white guy, the image of that gamer that exists in your head is probably quite an off-putting one. And my descriptions in, in this video haven't improved your opinion. And this is exactly what those far-right people colonising those communities want. They want gamers in gaming to be alienated from the left, because as much as the culture wars are bullshit and false consciousness, they absolutely work for the right. The goal is to make sure that people who like games find community and then realise what the cost of that community is and feel able and willing to pay that cost. A lot of people will have acquiesced to an unpleasant or awkward vibe because they didn't want to ruin an event or a conversation. And I include myself in this. I've had to put up with conversations where I wish I'd just walked away or at least said something. And it's that silence and absence they rely on. It means they're free to radicalize people in gaming communities against the left. It creates a culture that's hostile to women, LGBTQ people, and minorities who make up a significant part of the actually existing gamers that play video games. 
but their exclusion from the communities mean that the right and the far right are free to reproduce their ideology among gamers. That's why when you see a streamer have a heated gamer moment, or engage in queerphobia, or recycle Gamergate talking points, that you see an army of people love bombing them. Creators in gamer spaces are being radicalized too, and that's really worrying. That very quickly becomes a reciprocal relationship where the audience and creator parasocially pull each other along into radicalization. It's like how electromagnetic radiation propagates itself. Part of this is, of course, that it's unpleasant to be corrected. Some of you will recognize this from the turf playbook on social media, but it can feel like everything is stacked against us in gamer spaces and in the culture which makes it tempting to say, not my circus, not my monkeys, and just walk away from the whole thing or create siloed communities that are safe for us. Thinking about Inside Left's original message about this and the what can the left do about it part in particular, I'm just kind of left with the broad question. Is this even our issue to fix? Depending on how you've reacted to the video so far, you've probably either leaped to yes, obviously, or no. The no side of this will probably come with a wider variety of reasonings ranging from it's not the most productive use of our time to someone who's just fundamentally rejected everything I've said so far and then saying gaming is an apolitical space, stop trying to make it political and trying to infiltrate it. And to those who are in that last camp, this section probably is where you need to just like leave the video and that's okay, but the rest of this video isn't for you so much as about you and I think that would be an unpleasant and disorienting like sensation you you're free to leave you you are dismissed if you if you are in that camp when I approached this issue initially the first thing that came into my head was haven't we been here recently a lot of this conversation about radicalizing fandoms and the particular demographics I mentioned feel familiar young men who are largely white finding community online or via parasociality. It reminded me of the discourse around Andrew Tate and the young men and boys who get caught up in a particular misogynist shtick and fandom. Th that it was our responsibility as the left and particular thought leaders on the left to get these people de-radicalized. Now, I want to make this very clear. De-radicalization is one of the fronts we have to be fighting on. We have to be everywhere at all times. And that's kind of what's exhausting about the work, so to speak. The thing is that two things bother me about the radicalization discourse. And maybe this is a thread to pull on in another video, but here they are. One, content creators have a habit of overemphasizing their ability to de-radicalize people. Two, there's a danger that in focusing too much on de-radicalization, we don't spend enough time organizing with our comrades who are harmed by those radicalized to the right. And three, those who push de-radicalization as the metric of how good of a leftist you are, or as the primary mode of their praxis, tend to then lean into demands that the guys who are best described as like kind of a Nazi, but figuring that shit out, they have to be included in leftist spaces lest we engage in purity politics or even be accused of carceral logic. And that last one really bothers me, and this bit is not scripted so you can tell I'm gonna get really mad about it, but the thing that bothers me about that is that I'm not even sure leftist spaces are the best place for those people being de-radicalized. They need a specific environment and a lot of work and you know, are our spaces the place where that can be done in the best way? I'm not, I'm not so sure, right? With that in mind, and with the sour taste that some advocates for a de-radicalization first strategy have left, it can be tempting for us, even those with proximity to gaming culture and communities to say, this isn't our problem. Our value as leftists in a given space is not defined by our ability to de-radicalize people and we simply have better things to do. 
In the case of the Andrew Tate fan, the argument for de-radicalization looked like people demanding parasocial father figures to give good dating advice to angry young men. And in the gaming sphere, I'm going to be honest, it doesn't look terribly different. Should those of us with a platform who are leftists be visible leftists and make de-radicalization our purpose? It's a question that's kind of up for debate, but I'm not completely unaware of how the world works. Inaction does have consequences and logical conclusions. If we collectively say the cultural and social issues of gamers are not our problem as the political left, then depending on how you view our historic position in that space, we either abdicated our position in those communities or have just refused to enter them where we might have made some difference. Whether we like it or not, inaction does create a vacuum. Some proportion of us in those spaces can compete with the far right and can work to prevent them from colonizing communities that we're a member of. If it's not us, then that task often falls to corporate entities, and that's where things start to go really badly wrong in a lot of cases. Game developers and publishers, and really the whole video games industry, have a lot of institutional problems. Whether that's terrible working conditions, sexism, or really anything you can think of, and it's almost as if the institutional culture of the companies in this industry impacts the kind of person who thrives in the community. Much to think about, I guess. Think back to the Nick Merckx incident from earlier. He decides to post something queerphobic, then Activision decide to remove his skin from the game, and now every blue tick with a bad opinion is love bombing the guy as he refuses to backtrack while insisting he's not personally queerphobic. And obviously, right minded people are telling him, hey, this is queerphobic, do not say this, you should apologize for it. To call this the worst of all worlds is a little bit of an understatement, and there are some reasons for that. One is that Nick Merckx presented an argument as part of his doubling down that made some sense to people who might be on the fence or just don't especially care, which is that he wants to educate his kids on this issue when he deems them ready. Now that position is wrong and ignores the basis for common public education on LGBTQ issues, namely that some children's parents are queerphobes almost as if we had evidence of that provided to us during the video, um, and that we want as few people as possible having the experience that people I knew at university had where they'd basically not heard of the concept of being gay outside of like insults used on the playground until the age of 18. The other is that a lot of people who defended Nick Merckx, without defending what he specifically said, it's worth noting, pointed out that Activision Blizzard has something of a record when it comes to what these people consider to be political in gaming spaces like women existing, for one. Which leads to the not entirely unfair accusation of this being hypocritical woke capitalism, where their support for marginalized communities is only really done so because they think it's profitable rather than as an actual point of principle. The reactionary counter to this is the commonly expressed go woke, go broke philosophy, where because conservatives can't think beyond basic consumption, they do things like purchase a bunch of Bud Light and then shoot it. Now this strategy has impacted the stock value of some companies, but you'll notice that I don't particularly seem to care about stock value or the companies engaging in this. That's because it is cynical. Activision made a business decision to disassociate itself from Nick Merck's queerphobic comments. If they thought it would be profitable to ignore it, you better believe they would have. Basically, my core feeling here is a pox on both their houses. But in relation to gaming and gaming spaces, this leaves a gap where reactionaries can really make hay. Which doesn't sit right with me, actually. It feels like a problem. I don't have the time to go into it in this video, but a lot of the mechanics of multiplayer games and communities rely on the, an element of this toxicity. So these things are often tolerated, as I've said earlier in the video, the price of admission to a community, which is an atmosphere that's rife for radicalization towards reactionary positions and alienation from leftists. I'd also point out 
But a significant point in favor of the idea that this isn't a space we should enter with the intention of sort of intervening politically or as active de-radicalizer is that oftentimes these communities do skew young and people have been known to grow out of these behaviors once they actually change their surroundings or their lives change or they hit like the age of 23 and suddenly hanging out with edgy teens doesn't feel so cool anymore. So maybe this is a problem that solves itself and we could just ignore it. No? Not satisfying for you? Yeah, it's not satisfying for me either. So let's consider the other possibility, that it is in fact our problem, that gamers, their culture, are something that not only we can do something about, but should. What does that look like and what's the case for this? Well, the case is obvious. Gaming is a hobby variously engaged with by a massive number of people. That means the odds that someone in a fandom or who is in this culture will then take their politics away from their keyboard goes up. It also means that minorities in these communities, while perfectly capable of standing up for themselves, can feel repulsed and unwelcome in the mainstream of communities for things they feel passionate about. And that sucks. So we have a dual obligation to minimize the negative spillover from gaming culture, like the aforementioned Gamergate, and to provide support for our marginalized comrades in these spaces. It may not be a surprise that I fall into the it's our problem camp but I'm being tricky. See, Inside Left wanted to talk about the left as the primary actors, and the fact is that not every member of the left is equipped or frankly cares about this, and that's okay. We need to be everywhere at once in various capacities. There's a lot to do, and this is very much kind of a sideshow, right? That being said, if you've made it this far into the video, you probably care enough to hear what I think should be the course of action here. Firstly, don't let reactionaries ruin your enjoyment of things that you're passionate about. I happen to be particularly experienced in this area given that I enjoy both Paradox games and Warhammer 40k. Sometimes bad people have good taste, and there's nothing you can really do about that. Second, while becoming the pillar of a community that's already established is hard and kind of seems like infiltration-y when I say it like that, if you do feel up for it, Become active and challenge some of these behaviors as best you can. And I get that it's asking a lot and you don't have to do it. I'm just some person online, right? But fandoms can be diverse and seeing someone else who has good opinions can be reassuring or galvanizing. Though if you are going to do this, I would suggest you be prepared to construct something analogous to an echo chamber for like-minded people in your specific gaming fandom, or maybe such a thing already exists. Being active there may feel like you've siloed yourself off from the problem area, but as I explained way back in like the second video I ever did, ideological cohesion and building confidence in that space is a potential utility there. Finally, and this is going to be the most content creator TM thing I'm ever gonna say, so just make your peace with it. We need people to write and record and do all of that kind of thing about the things that they enjoy, particularly left-wing people. Yeah, I get it, the YouTuber is asking for more content, but it doesn't have to be content creation in the way that I do it. You could write a blog, do it as a podcast, just anything if you feel able to provide a perspective. The point of this isn't just that more content is good because I desperately need things to watch at 11.30pm on the sofa, it's that by demonstrating that we're out here among the gamers, we could at least make people feel like they're less alone. It's also apparently the case that encountering left of centre content may at least dispel some of the radicalization. Not often, not always, but there's a higher chance than if it didn't exist at all. I don't think we should go out to debunk or dunk on these people directly, at least if de-radicalization is what we're aiming for. I doubt a person on the opposite end of the political spectrum telling you that you're wrong would change your mind. So build your projects if you're so able or inclined, or at least exist, because sometimes it can be real lonely out there. Whew. 
Alright, that was a lot for me, on a topic that I didn't really feel when it was forced onto me by the patrons, but I hope that was at least entertaining. I really, really got a grip on the topic as I was writing that, so it was really good. Gamers and gaming culture ended up being a great proxy for loads of things. Even if this video came about because I was out of ideas, I have some ideas, which is, which is, I suppose, good. But if you want sort of a broader conclusion, it's this. And I'm aware that this is very much like asking a lot of people potentially. But it is the things that I said before, which is to consider this our problem and to just take the basic step of being present, existing, arguing occasionally, because I know we love doing that, and just being opinionated. Make more content. Specifically make more content about how these things relate to you. I remember I did a very, very particular video about how a game related to me, and it's now, uh, as of recording, my third most popular um, video. So, you know, it is not necessarily a path to being ignored. It can, it can be good. And that, that was really just me humble bragging. Okay, look, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up. But I do want to thank Inside Left specifically for the topic idea. I think this video, once I've edited it up, will be one of my favorite videos that I've made. So I wanna thank him specifically. If you haven't already done so, you should go subscribe to him. There'll be a link to his channel and latest video in the description. Go check it out, okay? I also want to thank my proofreaders who made sure that I kept this kind of tight and functional. And I always forget, but the thumbnails recently have been excellent. And that is not my doing because I cannot do graphic design for a lot of reasons. But it is because of friend of the show, Emma, who makes the thumbnails, has made the past few thumbnails, it link to his thing on the website formerly known as Twitter will be down below. You can get in touch with him that way if you want to commission him for anything. It's, it's just very good. He's just very good. And I want to thank my patrons, particularly the top tier patrons, Drone Riff, John N, Kersley Scheider, and Mercutio. Thank you to them in particular and everyone else on the Patreon. If you want to get your shout out, if you want at least one video a month early, if you want to be able to tell me what your 2013 ass idea is and make me do it, well, you go over to the Patreon, which I know is having a bit of technical difficulties as of the recording, but hey, you know, still the best way to pay me, I guess. But... Otherwise, just remember to like and subscribe, and I will catch you all on the next one. See ya!